Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast has evolved over the five plus years since it first launched. From now on, I'm going to be talking about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. And also mindset, of course, but mindset of all kinds, not just business mindset. I think. Things are changing for me, as you may have noticed if you've been following me online or listening to this podcast, so anything goes here. I hope you stay along for the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today, and now let's get into this week's episode. Hello and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 367. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another solo episode. Today, I'm going to talk about finding yourself through solo travel and outdoor adventures. You may have noticed that I'm talking a lot more about hiking and nature travel and outdoor adventures lately. That is where I'm going with my work. The focus, I think what I'm stepping into is knowing yourself and getting to know yourself better and self-knowledge and personal growth and personal development through outdoor adventures and outdoor travel. That's what it looks like at this point. I've been reflecting a lot lately on how my solo travel and my solo outdoor adventures have helped me get to know myself better. I've learned so much about myself ever since I started traveling alone, and that was way back in 1994, 1995 school year when I studied abroad in Spain. So what are you going to learn today? You're going to learn things you can learn about yourself through solo travel and outdoor adventures, how you can use solo travel and adventures to get to know yourself better, how to get started on your first solo adventure if you haven't done so before, and how to plan the next best solo adventure for you if you're already an experienced solo traveler. So let's get into the topic. First, I wanted to start out by asking you, when was the last time you went on a solo adventure or had a solo trip somewhere? A lot of people are used to traveling alone. A lot of people enjoy traveling alone. Some people don't. A lot of people have never done it for a variety of reasons. So if you're one of those people who hasn't traveled alone before or hasn't in a long time, I would like to invite you to use this podcast as inspiration for planning a new solo adventure. Things are starting to open up now. We're starting to come down out of lockdown. People are starting to travel. And now is the time to start planning new adventures. So Let's get started. One of the first things that I learned through solo travel, and I think this is something that a lot of people learn, is that experiences are more important than material objects. Now, people that, obviously this isn't a truth set in stone, but people who tend to travel on a regular basis and people who love travel generally find that to them, experiences are more important than material objects. And that's why every year when my birthday comes around, and this is fresh in my mind because I just had a birthday uh, a couple weeks ago, I tend to think about what I want to experience that day rather than what gifts I want to receive. Often I'll go on a walk with my husband or we'll go on a day trip somewhere. And to me, it's all about what I want to experience that day. It's maybe something different that I don't normally experience, or usually it's just doing something with him that I might normally do alone. So one of the most important things to me was learning that experiences are super important. And after I first started traveling that year that I studied abroad, I started seeing the world differently. And I started rather than buying stuff in life, I I started thinking about how I could save my money to have more experiences like that, more traveling, more adventures, and, and how I could rearrange my life to get those adventures. Uh, So for me, it's been all about the experiences rather than accumulating stuff. Next, one thing that I've learned is what's important to me. What I want to do on my adventure, what I want to do on my trip, where I want to go, rather than doing what the guides say to do, rather than doing what your guidebook or if you go on a tour, a tour guide, what they say is important. 
And I think this is an important part of self-knowledge because when you travel alone, you try things out. You don't have to do what other people want to do. You can do exactly what you want to do. Sometimes you might make the mistake of doing what the guidebook says is important to see, even though you don't really care. But little by little, you will learn that you are responsible for your own experience and you can do what you want to do and you don't have to do the stuff that the guidebook says is important. And and you start learning about yourself. You start learning what kinds of things do you like to do. Are you a museum person? Maybe you hate museums. You don't have to go to museums. Maybe you like to go to all the gardens. Maybe you like to see castles and estates and and historical places. I don't know. It's different for everyone. So the thing about traveling alone is it helps you get to know what's important to you in terms of what kind of experiences you want to have. Which leads me on to the next topic, personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is something that's really important to me, like taking responsibility for my own life, my own choices, my own mistakes. And travel, I think, teaches you this because when you're traveling alone, you are responsible for yourself. It, it becomes harder and harder to blame other people for things that were 100% your responsibility. Like if you're buying your own travel tickets, if you're, if you're booking a flight, if you're booking a tour, if you're packing your bag, you are responsible for making sure those things get done correctly. I was just a few weeks ago booking my, all the places I'm going to stay at for my Ridgeway walk in September, and I messed up one of the dates. And I had the spreadsheet of where I was going each night, where I need to stay each night, and somehow I got off on one day and then the whole rest of the days got messed up. So I had to go back in and rebook. And thankfully, I'd done this on booking.com so I could reschedule without penalties. But that was my fault. Like I had a spreadsheet. How did I mess that up? I don't know. But it was 100% my responsibility having done that. So the more you travel alone, the more you start to take responsibility for your own mistakes, for the things that you do for the things that you experience. And that leads me into the next topic, which is planning. In the same way that you are responsible for your experience, you're responsible for planning your experience, and it's important to plan certain things in advance. Now, when you're traveling alone, some things you can plan when you get there, you can play it by ear, see what you want to do, but other things you have to plan in advance. If you want to go see something in the theater, you're going to have to plan that in advance. Because if you wait to the last minute, you might not get tickets to the thing that you want. So planning and being responsible for your plans and knowing how you want to plan, like learning your own personal planning style and learning how you want to have your experiences and how you want to plan your experiences is another thing that you can learn about yourself. Like, do you like to be super busy all day, every day? And do you like to have like every hour of the day planned? Or do you like to play it by ear some days? And do you like to plan other days? This is really, I think, useful because when you learn how you as an individual like to plan your travel, I think that can help you to know how you want to plan your life, like when you, before and after your travel. I'm a big planner. So, and I'm really, really mindful about how I spend my time. And so when I plan my outdoors adventures and when I plan my solo travel, I think that reflects on how I plan my day-to-day -day life and my week-to-week -week life. With planning comes packing. So what to take and what to leave behind and packing light rather than bringing everything with you. People are often surprised by how light I pack. I don't think I'm that light of a packer, but I've constantly, over the years, heard comments from people saying, wow, that's all you've brought. So I think I do pack light. So another thing that you learn about yourself when you're planning ahead and planning what to take and what to leave behind is what matters, what's important to you. Even though I pack light, there are certain extra little things that I will bring for comfort. Like, for example, if I'm going camping, I always bring an extra pair of like fluffy socks so that my feet are warm and fluffy at night. <laughs> Part of that's a practical thing because I don't want to wear my 
used sweaty hiking socks from the day in my sleeping bag because I try to keep it as clean as possible. And I always sleep in special night clothes. Like I have a, a set of thermals that I wear at night for sleeping. I don't sleep in my normal hiking clothes, but it's also a comfort thing. I like having nice, fluffy, warm socks when I'm camping. And, you know, now in the summer, that's not as necessary. The last couple of times I've gone camping in the summer, I haven't slept in socks at all. But but in the colder months, that's something that's important for me to have. So you learn what are the extra little comforts that you like to have. You learn what matters to you. And again, these are things that you can apply in your day-to-day life. When you learn, when you have to pack everything into a small backpack or a carry-on bag, you really have to be mindful about what you're taking and what you're leaving behind. And this can also help you to focus on what matters in your day-to-day life before and after your trip. Another thing that you can learn from solo travel is self-trust and listening to your intuition. There have been so many times when I've been traveling alone in places that I've never been to before where I felt like, eh, that doesn't feel quite right. I don't know. I think I shouldn't walk down that street. I think I'll go this way instead. Or maybe I'll just head back to my room tonight. Um, and I really think that when you're alone and there's no one else you can rely on, you learn to trust yourself more and you learn to listen to your intuition more. And I think that's a hugely valuable tool in day-to-day life. Learning to trust myself and learning to trust my intuition has been one of the most important things I've learned in my life. It is a super valuable life skill. And again, I think that can be honed by traveling alone and by having outdoor adventures alone. Um, I was just talking the other day about someone, we were talking about wild camping, and she said she had read my latest blog post about um, solo hiking for women, and she was like, do you really think it's best to to camp away from a road, or do you think it's better to camp near a road? Because I was with a friend, and we were debating about this. And I said, I personally absolutely think that I would feel safer camping in the middle of nowhere rather than next to a road because I feel like roads bring danger and roads bring people and I would just feel safer in the middle of nowhere. Um, But again, that's me personally. So that's kind of a thing, like an intuitive thing that I feel. Like if I'm going to go wild camping, I'm not going to do it near a road. Um, And if I'm going to be camping alone, I'm not going to do it near a road. Um, So I think Listening to your intuition and taking action on it and learning to trust yourself are super important things that you can learn from being alone on travel and outdoor adventures, which leads me to the next thing. I love how these all lead into each other. I didn't plan it this way. I keep like moving them around as I'm looking at my list. Solo travel can help you to face your fears, can help you to stretch out of your comfort zone. I was a bit fearful of traveling alone when I first started out. I mean, I was 21 years old. I, you know, hadn't been outside of my home country before, suddenly living in another country, traveling in another country. And there were some things that I was scared of. I was a bit like, I was super shy back then and like kind of fearful. So for me, traveling alone was a huge stretch out of my comfort zone. And You know, the first time I went camping alone was a huge stretch out of my comfort zone. Like my ears were like pricked all night long. It was like every little footstep or sound or voice or whatever, um, I woke up. And obviously I'm better at that now, but but that's because I've stretched out of my comfort zone and now it's okay for me to go camping alone and now it's okay for me to travel alone. Um, Because again, I trust myself and I trust my intuition. But solo travel and solo outdoor adventures can be a great way to stretch out of your comfort zone. And like I always say, when you stretch out of your comfort zone in one area of your life, it will stretch that comfort zone in all areas of your life, which means you'll be more comfortable taking risks in other areas of your life, including professional life, business, whatever. Um, And another thing that you learn from traveling alone is that it's okay to be alone. I used to be so, like I said, shy, quiet, low confidence, and I always felt really self-conscious about traveling alone and eating dinner alone and going to a restaurant alone. And I felt like, again, 
no one cares. But I always felt like people are going to think I don't have any friends when really it's just that I like being alone. And But I just used to make it mean all these things and what are people thinking? And of course, no one's thinking anything, but it it caused me a bit of anxiety. And I feel like solo travel is like a muscle. Like the more you do it, the more, the better you get at it. And the more you realize it's okay to be alone. No one's thinking about you. They're all focusing on the things that they're doing. And if they think you're weird for having dinner alone, so be it. Bring a book, bring your guidebook. That has always been my go-to thing. Like when I eat alone, I always bring my guidebook with me and I, I look through where I've been that day, where I'm going the next day, what might I want to do the next day. I do that even when I'm walking a long distance trail and I know where I'm going the next day and I know what I'm doing the next day. I still read through what's coming up with the next day on the trail so I can just kind of have it fresh in my mind. So, you know, read a book, listen to an audiobook, whatever, um, play on your phone. But it's okay to be alone. It's okay to go to museums alone. It's okay to have dinner alone. It's okay to go to the movies alone. It's okay to travel alone. It's okay to go hiking alone. Like all this, like whatever stuff you like doing, it's okay to do that alone. And that's something that I've learned from doing lots of stuff alone. <laughs> now, again, I need to say this is not for everyone. I think some people genuinely like traveling with other people and hiking with other people and going camping with other people. And that's great. And I still think there's a lot that we can learn from having these adventures on our own. So even if you're the kind of person who loves people and loves doing things with other people, maybe try a solo adventure. Give it a try. Um, so it's okay to be alone. And which leads on to learn to enjoy your own company. Um, I'm an only child. I grew up in an area like my neighborhood didn't have a lot of kids. So I was always like playing alone and reading alone. And I was good at being alone from a young age. So I've always kind of, I don't know if I've necessarily always enjoyed my own company, but I've always been good at being alone. But a lot of people aren't. Which is why when you engage in solo travel and solo outdoor adventures, you learn to enjoy your own company because you're stuck with yourself. And and this is the beauty of solo travel and solo hiking and solo outdoor adventures is that you've only got yourself to be with. And I think, I think that's one thing that a lot of people are scared of, but it's like stuff comes up. And I talk about this with Yvette Webster next week on next week's episode, which is so good. We talk about how when you're outdoors and you're alone, it's like stuff comes up and you can't avoid it, which is great, which is scary, I think, sometimes. But it's great because all the stuff that we've been repressing and sweeping under the rug, it's there. It bubbles up to the surface. And you can't not look at it because you're alone and you have nothing else to do. Now, you could drown it out with an audiobook or podcast. And I think a lot of people do that, like when they go on solo hikes. I, I read a lot of books about people that are through hiking that listen to podcasts or listen to audiobooks. And I think that, you know, if that works for you, that's great. I also think you're missing out on, you know, the stuff that might be coming up for you if you didn't drown out that inner voice. But again, do what works for you. Um, so learning to enjoy your own company, I think, is super, super important. I think it's really important for us to be okay with ourselves. And a lot of times we don't enjoy our own company because we're afraid of what's going to come up. And if you just face that fear and let the stuff come up, assuming your mental health, okay, so assuming your mental health is is reasonably good, um, if it's not, get the mental health care support that you need. Um, but assuming that your mental health is reasonable, let the stuff bubble up and deal with it. Let those fears bubble up and deal with them. Let the lack of confidence bubble up and deal with it. Um, that's part of personal development. Uh, next, confidence. I feel so much more confident in myself since I started traveling alone. Just knowing that I I'm alone and I can only rely on myself for the stuff that I need. And, you know, there's no one else out there. 
And yes, I can ask for help if I need it, but you know what I mean. It's like, it just feels really empowering and it gives me confidence and it makes me feel super like independent and strong. And I really just love it. Um, I just love the feeling I get when I travel alone. And I think maybe kind of that in high of independence has diminished a little bit perhaps now that I'm so used to this. Um, but I just remember in the beginning when I was younger, like I would go on, a, on an adventure, I would travel and I would come back and I would just feel so good about myself. And this was great because this was a time when my self-esteem was not that great. Um, so to have that solo travel give me a boost in self-esteem was just really great. And I always came back just feeling so proud of myself and good with, about myself. And, and that was a rare thing back then. So confidence, independence, empowerment, like this is all good stuff that you get from solo travel. Um, now I've got two last things that I want to talk about. And they don't naturally lead on from the stuff that I was just talking about, which is, which is a shame. Um, but they're important things to say. So as I said earlier, you know, what matters, like you learn what matters, what to leave behind, what to take with you. You also learn to live less, I think. Um, if you are a person who packs light and you have learned how to pack light, then you might find that it's easier for you to live with less stuff when you get back from your trip. I always find it so weird when I get back from a long distance trail where I've been living out of a 36 liter backpack for a week and I come home and I unload my backpack and I wash all my stuff and I've got all this stuff in my house. Like there's so much stuff. And I don't even think I have a ton of stuff compared to some people because our house is so small. But but I just have all this stuff all of a sudden, stuff that wouldn't fit in a 36 liter backpack. And, and a lot of times when I come back, I, I declutter. Like I get rid of stuff. I take stuff down to the charity shops. I get rid of books. I get rid of old clothes. And I, I mean, I love decluttering. If you've heard me talk about this before, you know how much I love decluttering. But I think that packing light, and it's, it's even more important to pack light when we're traveling alone because we don't have anyone to help us with our bags and we can't share bags with other people. So, so we're more likely to pack light. So when we engage in slow travel, when we learn how to pack light, this can have a knock on effect in our day to day lives and can help us declutter and learn to live with less stuff. And this kind of goes back to the first thing that I mentioned, which is experiences can be more important than material objects. Finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about is being alert and paying attention. And I think this is an important thing that I've learned through solo travel because there have been times when I've had stuff stolen. I remember when I first started traveling alone, I... I started like numbering the stuff that I had with me. It was like I had my winter coat, I had my backpack, and then I had another bag. So it was like I had three things. And everywhere I went, anytime I stood up, anytime I walked somewhere, it was like, do I have my three things? One, two, three, good. Um, and, and I used to do that all the time when I would travel. Like however many number of things I had, I would like constantly count them. I was like, one, two, three, four, okay, got everything. Um, and so I, I learned how to be super alert and to take care of my stuff and to take responsibility for my stuff because again I tend to travel light and I if I lose my stuff stuff is gone I don't have a lot left <laughs> um so I I learned how to be alert and pay attention to my stuff but like I said I've also had times that you know stuff has gone wrong I remember this one time at an internet cafe um back when I was living in Costa Rica in 1996 I had just changed some money and then I'd gone to this internet cafe and I had my wallet stupidly on the table where the computers were like next to the mouse. And I was sending emails and it was like out of the corner of my eye, I saw a movement. And then I didn't realize until later what happened, but these guys that were at the computer next to me had grabbed my wallet, taken the money out of it and 
you know, then left. <laughs> um, so that was me not being super alert, not paying attention. And I learned from that. Again, I just changed money. So I lost more money than I would have if it had just been like a normal day. So I was really gutted. And at the time I was like teaching English. So I didn't have a ton of money. It was, it was not a good day. Um, but could have been worse. So, so I think, I'm not saying that travel is dangerous, but I think traveling alone has really, really helped me to be alert and pay attention. And I remember years later when I lived in Buenos Aires, um, a lot of people from the office would either like not get scammed, but like people would try to rob them on the way into the office. And, and I remember, I remember this one time I was walking. Um, I may have told this story before on the podcast. So if, if I have, please excuse me. I was walking down the street and I was with someone walking down the sidewalk and I'm on the street side of the sidewalk and out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy crossing the street coming straight towards me. And it was weird. Like he was coming right at me. And so I thought, oh, maybe it's someone I know. And so I turned and I looked right at him and I made eye contact with him. And the second we made eye contact, he made a sharp turn and he went behind like the opposite direction of me. 30 seconds later, I hear this woman screaming that someone stole her purse. And I see the same guy running down the street. So because I was alert in that situation, and because I was paying attention, I was not the one with my bag stolen. It was the other woman. Um, and she wasn't alone either. She was walking with another woman. But I noticed him coming. And I think because I looked him straight in the face and made eye contact with him, because I genuinely thought he was someone I knew. And he wasn't. He was someone who was going to rob me. But I think because I looked right at him and he realized, oh, you know, this is not good. She's seen me. He moved and he went for someone else. So being alert and paying attention, I think, is really a really useful skill in life that you can apply anywhere you go, at home or at travel. But I think that's something that you learn when you're traveling alone that you may not learn when you're traveling with someone else because you can kind of become complacent when you're traveling with other people. So that's stuff that you can learn about yourself on solo travel and solo adventures. Next question is how to get started on your first solo adventure. So think about what kinds of things you would like to do. Would you like to travel to an urban area? Would you like to travel to a rural area? Would you like to go on a hiking trip? Would you like to go camping or backpacking? Like what kind of experience do you want to have as your first solo adventure? And then just plan it, like read a ton of stuff online. We have so many resources now that we didn't have back in 1994 when I first started traveling alone. Go on the internet, read, read other people's adventures, read other people's solo travel blogs. This is one of the reasons why I write my books about walking, because I want to inspire people to get out alone and walk their own solo adventures. So read stuff, plan, and then have your first adventure. And same kind of goes for if you've been experienced in solo travel or solo outdoor adventures, but you haven't in a long time. How to plan your next solo adventure. Same thing. Like, what would you like to do? What have you enjoyed in the past? Do you want to do something that you've done before? Do you want to do something new? Maybe you've never gone to a foreign city alone. Do that. Plan something. Research it. Do it. So I would like to invite you, whether it's going to be your first solo adventure or your next solo adventure, I would like to invite you to spend some time today or in the next couple of days thinking about where you would like to go and start planning and maybe get some dates in the calendar so that you make sure that you do it because otherwise it's easy to get stuck in planning mode and just plan, 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 and then it never happens. So figure out where you want to go, get the dates in the calendar and start planning. And please drop me a line and let me know where you'll be going on your next solo adventure. You can email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me online and get in touch. I would love to hear from you. I love hearing from listeners. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a quick review online, whether it's Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. It would mean the world to me. Next week's episode, as I said, I have got the fantastic Yvette Webster. I'm super excited about having her on the show. We are going to be talking about how to take your hiking to the next level. I'm so excited about this. Um, Yvette is my blogging coach, and she blogs about hiking and outdoor adventures in Scotland. So I'm 
so excited to share this with you. She was the first woman to through hike the Scottish National Trail. So we talk about what she did to plan for that trail, all the stuff that went wrong, all the stuff that she learned. It's so good. So we're going to talk about how to take your outdoor adventures to the next level. So like for me, as you know, I've walked the South Downs Way, I've walked the Fridge Way, I've walked some shorter trails like the Way South Path and the Downs Link, but I really want to go on like a big backpacking trip where I'm hiking and wild camping every night. And that's probably going to happen up in Scotland. And there are a couple of trails that I want to do this on. One's an easier trail and one's a much more challenging trail. And I'm really leaning towards a more challenging trail, but I'm not sure if it's too much for me. So this episode will be super interesting for you if you want to learn how you can stretch yourself to new levels in the outdoors, how you can up your game with your hiking, how to know what's a good stretch for you and what's too much. I think you'll find this episode really interesting and useful. So thank you for joining me. And remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 367 for the show notes on this episode today. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed at hollywharton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.